welcome to another ASCD Virtual Learning Network webinar. Uh, I am Mark Barnes and uh, I see our room is filling up and that's very exciting. Um, and so uh, as people continue to move in, uh, we will involve them, but we will forge ahead. And uh, this is our second webinar after our original convening last year to sort of say, hey, what is this and where are we going? And um, each time we will build our webinar around uh, some sort of problem of practice, something where we're saying, what, uh, what problems do we have with educational or instructional shifts in heading to uh, teaching and learning using the Common Core State Standards? So um, let's move forward and take a look at our agenda for today. So uh, uh, we're going to have some brief introductions with just me saying a little bit about me in a moment and then I'll poll the audience and give you an opportunity to uh, say what area in education you are in. And uh, we'll go back a little bit to, uh, we'll rewind to uh, virtual learning network goals. Uh, we'll talk about some of the tools that we use, the key tools. We'll have a little refresher on those. Uh, we'll get to the problem of practice that we want to talk about today. And um, then uh, we're going to talk about uh, the core six and strategies. And um, hopefully at the end, uh, we'll get a little chance to maybe look ahead to webinar three. Okay, so um, I am Mark Barnes. And uh, I am uh, the author of Role Reversal and the Five-Minute Teacher, uh, both published by our host ASCD. I'm an ASCD faculty member. So um, you've got an opportunity at this poll. we we'll go A, B, C, D, E. So just tell us what you are. Are you in the K-3 world, the 4-6, the 7-9, the 10-12, or are you administrator slash other? You could be a principal, a curriculum director, uh, an academic coach, and uh, we'll find out. So those numbers are coming up. So right now it looks like we've got a, a large percentage in the, the K-3 world, 21%. Um, and then we've got uh, uh, a surprising amount in the, um, the admin other, up to almost 60%. I think we had a lot in the uh, admin other category in webinar one actually as well, which I think is great because it tells me that our administrators are doing all that they can to uh, help their teachers with the instructional shifts uh, leading or built around Common Core. And uh, now that that poll's done, we'll go right ahead and jump into poll two. Since we're talking about close reading today, let's find out what you know about the phrase close reading. Based on your background knowledge, would you call yourself A, an expert? Would you say that you are B, almost a pro? Would you say that in terms of close reading, you have an average knowledge? D, you've heard of it, but have little understanding. Keep in mind, I, I don't know who's who here. No one sees your name. So be honest so we get a good pulse for what the audience knows. Uh, e, I've never heard of close reading. And, and that's OK as well. So um, and you know we're in the social studies world, and I think that in close reading tends to be something that is really in the English language arts world, although it's really common core. So it is important that we figure it out. So this is good for us because what I'm seeing in poll results is that um, almost all of our audience has an average or below average understanding of close reading even with as, as a, a large number, 32% never heard of it, 20% heard of it, but have a little understanding. And, and only a fraction with a, you know, I really know this, so hopefully you, that fraction of people will have some things to say when we get to the part where we're responding. And we're going to do some responding today in our question box. So if you see your, your question box there on your control panel on the right, eventually we'll get to some uh, responding. Okay, so uh, that's sort of our preliminary stuff in the webinar today. And as we move forward on our agenda, we want to get to this problem of practice because this is really the, the meat and potatoes of this webinar today. So in some conversations with people in the social studies world, um, 
out on my social networks and uh, other places out in schools. I, I get in front of teachers uh, across the country and it's always exciting to be in front of educators and um, to share best practices and then to have conversation to say what's going on in the classroom and what do you think is difficult? What problems are you facing? A lot of what I'm hearing is this in social studies and I think our poll from a few minutes ago is a really good indication that this is a problem of practice. This idea of close reading. So I know based on the poll that a, a lot of you say, well I don't know about close reading, I'm not too familiar with close reading. Let's just think of the phrase itself and, and let's see if we can't get some feedback here. You've got your question box. If you go to your right and you use your control panel, you'll see a place that says questions. You can type in that place. So if I just said to you, if you even don't know a lot about close reading, but the phrase itself, you're a teacher or an educator who at some point has taught reading, what's close reading? Okay. And go ahead and type those in. They're coming in and I appreciate it. Uh, Gail says in-depth reading. And lots of people have ideas. Students reading, is that independently, Michelle? Uh, analysis of text. Um, smaller passages, Lisa says. Thinking strategies. Careful observations, Elaine. Thank you. A lot of excellent comments coming in. And uh, so this is great. Okay, so and you can keep them coming. We'll have them, but I'm going to go ahead and move on. Let's see what Park says. Partnership for assessment of readiness for college and careers. We've come to know Park as sort of the common core group. And Park says close analytical reading stresses engaging with a text of sufficient complexity directly and examining meaning thoroughly and methodically encouraging students to read and reread deliberately. Okay, I don't know what you think, but on my end, I say that seems complicated. I chose this picture because I'm really bad with this kind of stuff. I've never been the guy that can handle the the TV remotes and all. I just hand it off to my wife, as, as we all know, smarter, and say, go ahead and do this because I don't know how to make this TV run. So for me, that's complicated. That definition from Park for close reading, to me, seems really complicated. Now, Thomas Fuller says all things are difficult before they are easy. So um, let's see if we can't make them easy. So what I'd like to do, and this was in our agenda as well, is use the core six um, as, as a, a means for us to look at close reading and to make it easier, if we can. And the, the core six is uh, an, an ASCD book. Uh, you could get the book if you wanted to, but we are going to look at some of the strategies in the core six uh, in this webinar and in others as well. We're going to use this today to make our close reading less complicated than that crazy remote and the instructions that go with it. Now I won't sit here and read this lengthy piece to you. Uh, this comes from the core six and uh, I just wanted to put this one up to highlight the core six strategies. These are strategies for the instructional shift that helps us integrate common core state standards. So we're going to talk about reading for meaning. We're going to do this today. We're going to talk about comparing and contrasting as strategies for close reading. We're going to do that today. Other core six strategies are here and we'll get to those in future webinars. Inductive learning, circle of knowledge, right to learn, and vocabularies code. Now, uh, the authors of the Core 6 also say before we jump into the strategies, let's make sure that we
we, we talk about some tips for using the strategies in the classroom. And one of the important things is to involve our main stakeholder, the kids. So tip one, for example, explain the strategy's purpose and the student's role. You know, I think this is really underrated in, in lots of what we do in the classroom. I know as a, a young teacher, I didn't do this very often, and it, it was difficult for my students to make a connection to the real world and to say, why are you teaching me this skill or this concept? So I think this is an important one. Uh, teach the thinking embedded in the strategy. Uh, teaching thinking can be tricky, but the strategies themselves really, um, they envelop the idea of teaching thinking. And you see here what that looks like. We're talking about getting kids to think about the evidence to support ideas within text. Uh, looking at the text and saying, when and how is it used? Why does this evidence support arguments? Another tip for using these core six strategies is uh, discussion and questioning techniques. And this will help get the kids thinking. Um, we're going to ask students to synthesize and transfer their learning. So, you know, think Bloom's taxonomy here. And uh, we want to get kids in that higher level. We want to get them to uh, analyze and evaluate and synthesize. And uh, these core six strategies are going to help us do that. There's an example in here about debate. Debate's a really important higher level thinking skill. but here, the tip from Core 6 is going one step further, saying, now once we've done some debate, what if we then uh, find another debate and we compare it to the one that we're working on? And now we really get to higher level thinking. Uh, and this one I love. And again, I think this is, has to be a part of teaching and learning no matter what we're doing, and is often left out usually because teachers are concerned about time. I just don't have time for that. Uh, I learned late in my career as a, as a classroom teacher that uh, reflection was one of the most critical pieces of everyday teaching and learning in my class. Uh, we used blogs. And you know, anytime you can get in the digital world, it's really important. So we used blogs, and the kids would get on, and I would say, now, let's take a look at what we did today. What did we learn? Why did we learn it? Why is it important? Uh, when we get to the strategies here of comparing and contrasting, uh, you know, why do we do this? These are important things for kids to think about. So those are tips. Now, I said today, what I want to do is let you leave this webinar with something that if you're a teacher, you can say, OK, I have a better understanding of close reading. And I could go in the classroom tomorrow. And I have something that I could use to help my kids become close readers. And we're going to use a couple of these core six strategies to do this. So we're going to start with reading for meaning. Okay, So how do you get students to read for meaning? Let's, just, let's um, do some more responding here. Make this a little bit interactive again and get you typing in that question box. Um, before I even get to what the Course 6 says about reading for meaning, uh, what would you say about this? What would you say is, uh, how do you get your kids, your students, how do we get them to read for meaning instead of just reading for fun or reading and not knowing what they're reading? So people are starting to add some things in our window here, talking about um, discussions. Uh, questioning is a really important one. Uh, so I've got that from a, from a couple of people. Jessica, thanks. And um, you know, asking questions. Getting kids to question the text as well is, is really important. So we, we need to do that. Um, some people are talking about discussion having kids talk, maybe breaking out into smaller groups. Uh, writing, getting kids to write about the text as they read. Uh, Jennifer says, focus on purpose. Uh, and, and this is really important. Why are we doing something? 
because we often leave that out. And kids wonder. And sometimes I think we just assume that they know, and they really don't. Um, again, written responses, I'm seeing a lot of that. Questioning during reading. Um, highlighting important facts. So I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot of things here that, um, that are a good idea of what close reading means to us without having studied it all that much. Let's move forward. And again, let's, let's see what our authors in the Course 6 say about reading for meaning. And let's see again if we can't take away uh, some, some solid concepts and also some applicable strategies for the classroom. So um, here, we're, we're going to talk about managing text complexity. This is what the strategy for reading for meaning will do for us. We're going to manage text complexity. Uh, we're going to evaluate and use evidence. And um, we want to develop these core skills of reading. Uh, we're thinking main idea, making inferences, which is really higher level and very difficult for kids. Uh, we want to analyze, and not just fiction, but characters and content. How do we do it? So here are a few specific strategies. Okay, so if I'm going into the classroom tomorrow and I've got some text and I say I want my kids to begin reading for meaning, here are some strategies I can take. Okay, so I, I might identify a short text to read for meaning. Um, problems, graphs, tables, charts, uh, a, a small section of a chapter in a text, something I find on the internet. There's so many great things out there that fit within the realm of social studies or civics or geography or whatever it is we might be teaching. Uh, generate a list of statements from the text. Uh, we we want to get kids to look at these and to begin uh, thinking, is it right, is it not right, and can I support that with the text that I have read? I want to support or refute. And we want to start this at the young grades as well. I know we've got some K3 people here. We want to get kids thinking, why is something right or why is it wrong right away? Uh, record evidence, either while reading or after reading. So again, we're reading for meaning. We're talking about ideas. We're listing ideas. We're generating statements. We're saying this is right or it's wrong because of this. Uh, we're recording as we read. We're sharing the evidence. Some people in our chat talked about discussion. Talking about something is a crucial way for kids to learn. So we might break down to small group, to pairs, to say, let's look at this text, let's discuss it. Why is it right? Why is it wrong? Uh, and then we come back to the whole group. Let's take an example, because I, I think this is really what's uh, important about these kinds of presentations is to say, Okay, what if I had to do it? And that's tough because we've got such a diverse group of people here. Um, you know, we're, we're in the, the, the K-12 world plus administrators. So I just said, let's take one example. Now this would be more of a middle school, high school example. But um, I found this article, and uh, again, just surfing the internet. In, in fact, I think somebody in my social network maybe tweeted this out or shared it on Facebook. And I thought, wow, how what a perfect example for this presentation. So I took just a few paragraphs. Now you could do more depending on time. You could do the whole article or you could do just this. Now what we want to do is get kids to start reading this for meaning. Okay? So we're thinking about those strategies again. So the, the piece is about this um, rarely successful tactic known as discharge petition. Uh, there are some statements in the article uh, about this, about the minimum wage, about how this will be such a challenge because Democrats have to persuade Republicans. So this would be something that would be pretty easy and quick to go through in class. Back to our reading for meaning strategies. So I want my kids to um, maybe generate a list of statements from the text, or maybe I'm going to do that as the teacher, depending on the level that I'm teaching. 
uh, I want them to be able to support, to agree or disagree with the statements. Uh, and there's so many ways you can do this. I don't have to tell our audience how to teach because you know how to do that already. These are strategies that you can take and you can employ. Um, preview the statements and then uh, from there, again, you could break off into small groups. You could have kids working together. But let's think tools as well. These graphic organizers, and you find a lot of these around. You can find them out on the net. You may have some already. You can find them in a, a great resource like the Course 6. gives plenty of these examples, which I love. So this is what this might look like. So the top box is sort of just the explanation. So we're, we're going to put these statements in. So let's imagine that I, as the teacher, am going to do this. So I pick some statements that sort of are generalized from that article that we just read. And then on the left, I see evidence for. I'm going to support that as, yes, that's right, or evidence against. I'm going to say that's wrong. So what I would want to get to is something like this. So a student writes in red here, uh, Democrats force a vote on setting the federal minimum wage at 10, 10 an hour, and that is evidence in favor of the statement because it's right in the text. We have to get kids to understand when to go through text and say, well, I can support this for or against because it's on the page. Remember we talked about um, the higher level skills of inference, and I think that's a part of this, but sometimes we also have to look at uh, the support as being something that's right there. And then on the right side, the evidence against uh, this statement, the Democrats have an excellent chance of reaching their goal. Uh, here I think we're using a little bit more inferring with a combination of what's on the page um, and, and the students, the student or students, if they were working collaboratively, uh, write that statement in red. Discharge petition requires Democrats to persuade two dozen Republicans to defy their leadership. Now I might say uh, to, to the kid or kids in a group if they're doing this, I might say to them, um, uh, why do you say that? Because it's maybe not right on the page or I want them to get to it to demonstrate to me to connect those dots and to say if they have to persuade two dozen Republicans, that's going to be a very challenging thing to do. So I think that's a really helpful piece. Uh, I, I think that graphic organizer is tremendous and you can come up with those, but the key are the strategies themselves. Okay, so again, we're talking about close reading and we're looking at different things. The first is reading for meaning. We have to get the kids to understand what's going on in our selection, in our passage, in our graphs, in our charts. So we're reading for meaning and we're pulling that out. Now we're going to move on and we're going to really get closer to our reading with compare and contrast. I just love this picture uh, because of the weather that we've had. Wait, I don't know where, where you are, but here in Cleveland, it's, uh, the wind chills have been 20 to 30 below for the last few weeks. I thought, what a great picture uh, in terms of timeliness. So again, um, Let's remember, to add, this is just a quick sidebar reminder to continue our conversation out on ASCD Edge at our virtual learning network. We want to make sure that we do that so you could jump out there after and add something if you like or even now if you're so inclined to pull up two screens. Okay, so back to our compare and contrast as a strategy to be better at close reading. Okay, so why do we do it? Uh, the key reasons, according to the core six authors, uh, comparative thinking, comparative reading, and it's a best bet for raising student achievement. Comparing is embedded throughout our Common Core state standards. What the Common Core says is that these kinds of um, uh, skills are lacking in students and they are the ones that truly lead to higher level critical thinking, independent thinking, creative thinking. Uh, and there's a great deal of research to support that, that kids being able to compare across topic, across genre, uh, will really get them to uh, engage with content and to master the content. 
So what we want to do in compare contrast is, again, look at some things that will help us. Now, we've got the old Venn diagram here. Now, I'm not suggesting you should never use a Venn diagram. It might be one of your favorite tools. It's certainly, uh, someone might call it an oldie but a goodie. Um, but the X here is basically suggesting that uh, don't make this your go-to co um, compare and contrast uh, graphic organizer. Because the problem with the Venn diagram is that there's sometimes we just squeeze the middle. And, and we don't get enough of that overlap. And that's really what we want to bring out in the kids. What we might do, and this comes from the Core 6, we might try something like this instead. Marvelous social studies example. So again, let's, let's think here. Uh, this is called the Top Hat Organizer. We're talking about House of Representatives versus Senate. I think what helps here is to get kids um, in, into a category. We really want to categorize, so we, we might get them started. Again, depending on your age group, uh, I might say, I'm going to go House of Representatives, and uh, we're going to talk about term. And I'm going to say, they serve for two years, so let's go to Senate. What are they? And then maybe poll the kids. What other categories could we compare and contrast here? And then at the end, we want the kids to sum it all up. This is a very important skill. This is where... Uh, a lot of our students are going to be lacking, uh, and this is where we want them to get to be as we continue with Common Core testing, with any sort of, of evaluation, to be able to summarize and to use the, um, the written word uh, efficiently. So uh, using this one is great because they've got that space. Um, here's another one that's similar. Uh, but a little different. Again, you get used to these different graphic organizers, the kids will become very good at the close reading strategy. So here, um, I tried to go into a younger age. So I, I think we might be doing ancient civilizations maybe down around fourth or fifth grade. Um, the, uh, the word criteria in the middle is an important one. One of the core six strategies deals with vocabulary, which is an important part of close reading. We'll get to that in a, in a future webinar. We'll build that um, maybe around a different problem of practice. And, and maybe I'll remind you of close reading when we get there. But it's important that they understand these words. There's a lot of research that says kids struggle in, um, in, in their standardized test, not because they don't know the material, but because they get um, crippled by the vocabulary that shows up. So if a word like criteria comes up and the kid doesn't understand criteria, or maybe it really stretched out to something like criterion referenced, where they could really get um, tripped up by that. So we want to work with these along the way. And we're going to keep that middle category when we do these graphic organizers. And again, the teacher can come up with the criteria, or when you really get good at this, I think the kids will generate the criteria. So let's say we're doing Maya and Aztec, what criteria do we have? And I just chose these three. They were very easy to find. You could expand this out to internet searches, uh, web quests. There's so many great things that you can do uh, along the way to um, really get the kids engaged in these compare contrast activities. So here's another example, similar graphic organizer. Again, the middle category is always criteria. And here I'm back to my House and Senate, term, procedure, structure. So when we're thinking about the strategy, this is compare and contrast, and this is helping us with close reading. Here we're using description. We want to make sure we activate prior knowledge. Uh, we want to give that clear criteria to focus the descriptions. Uh, use your graphic organizers. You don't have to always copy these if paper's an issue. Kids can write them in a notebook. Again, if they're in the digital world, you can create these things so easily. You know, if your kids are one-to-one, -one, if they're in, in the tablets or other kinds of devices or desktops, get them into places where they can set these up. Uh, they'll like that. They'll be engaged with it because kids really like using the technology. Um, the conclusion in, in uh, compare and contrast is important. We want to get our kids, and again, I would go to the young ages as well. The more we start 
embedding the vocabulary into our younger kid classrooms, our younger students, the more efficient they will be as they continue. And test scores will go up. And I don't think that's the be-all, end-all here. Um, but it, it, you know, it is sort of the nature, the nature of the beast, if you will. They'll, the scores will go up if the kids get this stuff at an early age. So this draw conclusions phrase is such a tricky one. Um, and, and even for, for older kids, I think it's tough if you say, uh, let's compare contrast, let's list things um, if, we're, if we're just doing reading for meaning. Uh, let's now draw a conclusion based on the evidence. That's a very tricky phrase. So um, we want to get them to use that and we want to model it in class. Here are some questions, some models from the poor six. Uh, are the two items di uh, more alike or more different? What's the most important difference? What conclusions can you draw? And then think, go back to that, the bottom of that graphic organizer where they put in a couple of sentences. It's a great way to always kind of wrap up or to go to reflecting. Remember our tips from the beginning. That, and, and that can sort of be used that way. We're reflecting now. What conclusion can you draw? And that's a tremendous skill. So we're back here. How do I improve my students' close reading? Well, I read for meaning, first of all. I have to start reading for meaning. And this doesn't mean abandon reading for pleasure, because I think getting kids to love reading is really a critical piece to getting to reading for meaning and compare contrast and higher level thinking. So just to summarize that reading for meaning again, so we can take something away from here and apply it immediately back to the classroom, or if I'm an administrator, I can share it out with my, my staff. Um, identify short text. Try to find short text, because I think one of the things is we tend to go to longer texts. And, and that's not necessarily the best route. Uh, get some statements, whether you generate them or if you're at a higher learning level, letting kids generate those statements after uh, reading or pre-reading. Some generalizations about text. Um, preview statements. Go through the statements. Go through any other statements that may be in the text. Look for any bolded materials, any um, captions, charts. Get kids thinking ahead. Uh, record evidence while you read. So we do maybe our, our quick read at the beginning or our preview, then we start reading our closer reading, and while we do that, we want that tactile response. If you know anything about max teaching, another great reading strategy, or a, really a, a program of strategies, one of the big ones is what's, what's called tactile response. It's that um, if I have something I'm using, and now we're in the digital world, but you know, in the old days it was the pen or the pencil. Maybe now it's my iPod or my smartphone or my iPad, and I'm typing as I read. Uh, or I'm reading the text on a Kindle, and I'm annotating. Oh, kids love that. It's such an amazing thing. Um, get them to record their evidence as they're reading. Uh, share the evidence. Get them in pairs. Get them in threes and fours. Um, hey, this is what I found. What did you find? Where's your evidence? That's a key question. Where is your evidence? Show me that. Uh, or what inference did you make if it's not right on the page? And that's our reading for meaning. We did compare contrast. Again, we want to use description. Activate prior knowledge. Uh, what do we know already about these things? We want to use our criteria to focus. Remember when we were doing our comparisons, when we did our ancient civilizations, we're comparing maybe, maybe religion, maybe technology, dwellings. Get the kids thinking, these are the things I'm focused on for compare contrast. Get them to draw conclusions. Uh, higher level thinking, a critical phrase, uh, and, and uh, something that they need to be doing at a young age so they'll be better at it along the way. Okay, so um, that is, uh, I feel like it's rapid fire, and, and not as much from you as I would like, but, um, but a little bit uh, from you, a little bit of polling earlier. And I got a couple of poll questions left, so don't go away yet. Um, 
and we did the problem of practice today built around close reading. I hope you have a much better understanding of close reading. And I don't know that being able to regurgitate that park definition is really where we want to be. I think what we went for was what's the easier way, and, and we took two important strategies from the course six. Uh, think about where we want to be next. Uh, consider your own daily practice. Talk to your peers, people who teach in your subject area. Think Common Core and think what are the problems that I'm having on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, things that I don't know. So today if you came in and you said, um, wow, we did close reading and I didn't really know close reading. Uh, and now I do. Or, uh, you know, maybe you go to the Common Core and you read some standards. You think, ooh, I don't get this one. I'm not really sure how to do that um, or how to do this. Maybe it's technology. We're really moving toward technology use. Uh, you know, a lot of schools are one-to-one. -one. We're digitally uh, enhancing everything we do. Well, a problem could be about that. So what I'd like to do is take it to here and, and really rely on you. If we can get to that ASCD edge and then get in there and, and give us some problems of practice, I'll put a question up and say, hey, what should we talk about next time? And then we'll generate that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll generate that, that webinar. I'll facilitate based on what you ask for. Okay, so uh, we're going to move to poll question three. So just agree or disagree, A, agree, B, disagree, the content of this webinar bettered my understanding of the instructional shift. Uh, so we're talking about moving um, into using close reading strategies. Our next one, this is poll question four, agree or disagree? Again, for the Gates Foundation, the ideas and resources shared will help me implement the Common Core State Standards in my own classroom or help me help teachers. I know we've got a lot of administrators here. Appreciate you voting on this. It's helpful to ASCD, uh, helpful to me. And our final question of the day, agree or disagree for grant information, I am using or will use the ASCD EDGE site to continue the conversation around the topics. That's that ASCD Virtual Learning Network group. So you're saying I'm using or I will. You might say, well, I didn't know about it, but today I do and I'm going to go use it. I'm using or will use. Okay, so um, what's next? Well, again, continue the conversation on ASCD Edge VLN group site. It, it's so important for you to get there. Some people are. I really appreciate you who are there. I try to get in there daily. When I get a, uh, someone just left a question about a video I posted the other day and I got in and responded to that, feel free to keep that conversation going. But also, add your own stuff, please. What links do you see? What articles are important? What questions do you have? What do you want to talk about in a future webinar? What information would you like for me to provide? I will go and find it or get my amazing team at ASCD to help me go and find it. Finally, meet back here. Our third webinar um, in this series for this year is March 25th, 3 p.m. So if you want to put that on your calendar, uh, it will also be on the ASCD VLN site and that calendar so you'll know about it. Um, and then, um, again, reach out to me. Uh, if you want to contact me on Twitter, I'm at MarkBarnes19. Uh, if you want to um, talk to me on that VLN social studies site, please do that. And uh, if you need to email me, feel free, mark.barnes.faculty at ASCD.org. And uh, once again, I am going to thank you so much for attending today. That is all we have for this one. Uh, thank our hosts at ASCD for helping out behind the scenes. Hopefully things ran smoothly. And uh, I'll see you in the in cyberspace, ASCD Edge, on Twitter and other places. I'll see you back here next month. Have a great day.